We're grateful to be able to bring in our uh, first guest of the 11 o'clock hour, uh, Dr. Jason Schwalb. He is with the uh, Neurological Surgery Division over at Henry Ford West Bloomfield to talk more about Parkinson's disease. Great to have you with us, doctor. How are you today? I'm well. Good morning. Can I ask you, when we have someone such as Michael J. Fox, who is such a high-profile individual, when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he's also now made it his life mission. Does that help you and other doctors and research wow. to be able to raise awareness about Parkinson's? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think in general, um, people who know someone with a condition, it, it raises their uh, awareness, whether that's someone in their family or someone famous or someone in the news. Um, it, it, it's, it's somewhat of a double-edged sword. As one of my mentors used to say, you know, if you've seen one patient with Parkinson's disease, you've seen one patient with Parkinson's disease because they're all very, very different. And the spectrum of symptoms uh, and what goes on with patients with Parkinson's is, is very broad. And so you can't make broad generalizations you know, just by one person in the news like Michael J. Fox or uh, former Attorney General Janet Reno or someone like that. How challenging does it make it for you in trying to treat Parkinson's knowing that every patient is different? Well, there are some commonalities, but, but I think the progression of symptoms can vary and some people have more symptoms than others. I mean, for example, um, many patients with Parkinson's disease or many people think of Parkinson's disease as a disease characterized by tremor of about 20% of, of people with Parkinson's disease don't have any tremor. Um, so there are certain criteria for diagnosis uh, that are based on, on you know, a constellation of symptoms, um, but it can be somewhat variable. I know that uh, I think in reading there's about a million people here in the United States currently living with Parkinson's disease. How long, uh, once a person is diagnosed, does it shorten their lifespan or is it really a matter of trying to manage the symptoms? It's pretty variable and people with young onset Parkinson's disease are very different from people who get it in their 60s or 70s. Um, and, and so, you know, someone like Michael J. Fox, who, who was diagnosed, I believe, in his 30s, um, and may have even been showing symptoms earlier, it, they tend to have pretty slow progression uh, of their symptoms, um, especially the cognitive symptoms, um, whereas people who start developing symptoms in their 70s can, can definitely have uh, reduced life expectancy because they're uh, more liable to have issues with their thinking uh, and with dementia, and they're more likely to have falls, and, and falls and trauma are actually a huge cause of morbidity and mortality in the elderly. Dr. Jason Schwab with us here on the Megacast. He is a neurological surgery uh, department over at Henry Ford West Bloomfield. And I know that uh, Henry Ford West Bloomfield was one of the first hospitals uh, in the U.S. to use some new technology to try to assist some of the patients with Parkinson's. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, a, I'm a surgeon. So, you know, I see the patients where they're no longer getting benefit from their medications. And that's usually after about, uh, for many patients, it's after about five years of symptoms of treatment, although you know, we see patients that do great for 10 or 20 years uh, with standard treatment with medication. Um, so we put electrodes in people's brains uh, and connect those to pacemakers, essentially. Uh, but instead of pacing the heart, we pace the brain, and that can help with the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's disease including slowness of movement, rigidity, tremor. And what it really helps most with are people where they're taking their medications and they turn on and they get a bunch of extra movements like you see Michael J. Fox having, uh, and they flip unpredictably to being frozen waiting for their next dose to kick in. So uh, deep brain stimulation really kind of levels that out. Um, deep brain stimulation for movement disorders has been around you know, since the late 80s, early 90s, I personally have been doing deep brain stimulation implants since for 25 years now, uh, for a quarter century. 
Um, and for the appropriately chosen patient, it works great. Um, the thing that we got some press about recently was uh, a new device uh, from, a, from a different company that's a little different than, than some of the other companies that are out there. Um, but the, the technique is not particularly new. There's a lot of interesting things coming down the pike and in development uh, for new, smarter uh, systems and different ways of, of providing stimulation. Um, this device was built on a slightly different platform than prior devices were built on, uh, which may have some advantages in terms of how it delivers the current uh, and, and can really optimize the benefits of, of the surgery uh, and minimize side effects with stimulation. So after a surgery such as this, what is the um, recovery like? Or does it have to be replaced so many years? How does that work? What does it look like? Yeah, so so this device uh, that we just implanted um, is a rechargeable battery, and you charge it sort of like uh, these pads that you put your phone on uh -huh. so you don't have to plug it in. Everything's underneath the skin, but you put a pad over the, the pacemaker generator uh, and charge it usually once a week or so, and, and those batteries last 15 years. Um, and then they can be replaced as an outpatient procedure. Uh, in terms of the recovery, um, we tend to do it in different stages. We usually do one surgery where we implant the electrodes. Um, many places do that with patients awake. We, we do some with awake, but most of our patients we're doing in the intraoperative MRI scanner so that we can make sure the electrode's in the right position because if it's off three or four millimeters, it just doesn't work very well. Um, and then we do a second surgery where we put in the battery. So I, I would say that um, you know, people tend to be out of work for about two to four weeks uh, afterwards. It takes some time for my neurology colleagues to find like the best settings and the best way to deliver stimulation, but usually people are in pretty stable electrical settings once they're about two or three months out from surgery, uh, if it's surgery for Parkinson's. This is really uh, fascinating. And But following the surgery, how does it help reduce the symptoms of Parkinson's? Um, you know, to, there's a lot of theories. Uh, it, we used to think that it was the same as burning a hole and just burying the circuitry uh, by, by taking out another of the circuitry. It's probably a lot more complex than that. It changes kind of oscillations within the brain. Um, and puts patients more in a state like when they're taking their medications and getting good effects. Um, so it, it's fairly complex mathematically, and, and, and to be honest, to some extent, we don't really understand all of it. Uh, some of it is, is really empiric. For people that are living with Parkinson's, when you just mentioned there's new research and new things in development that are in the pipeline, is there hope that there is going to find a cure for Parkinson's at some point in time? Are you hopeful for that? I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's hard to say. I mean, I, you know, I'm old enough that I've been hearing, you know, that we're going to be having a cure in the in the next five years, you know, for the past 25 years. So, um, I, you know, but on the other hand, I don't think anyone would have thought that there was going to be a potential cure for sickle cell. And I think we're probably looking at that in the next five years. Um, so things can change. I don't think that deep brain stimulation is a cure for Parkinson's. There is a question as to whether it actually does slow down progression of the disease. I don't think the, we really know at this point, um, but it definitely doesn't cure people of the disease. Um, and we'll have to see you know, what other modalities and what other treatments are gonna come out in the next uh, 10, 20 years. But the brain is so incredibly complex. I mean, there are more synapses and connections between neurons in the brain than there are stars in the universe. Um, so it's very, it's very daunting to, to try and come up with cures. But uh, our research group, and, and I work closely with Peter LeWitt, who uh, is a wonderful, prominent neurologist in our group, you know, have been working on these issues for, for many years. So how much um, does this help improve a patient's quality of life? A lot. A lot. So, I, you know, when I, I think the biggest thing it does is it makes life a lot more predictable. 
And so for people who are fluctuating from having all these extra movements, or, you know, frankly, when you see Michael J. Fox with all these extra mu movements, it's probably because he's taken extra pills so that he's not frozen uh, and unable to move. And, and just to have that predictability, you know, makes a huge difference in terms of traveling, going out to eat, you know, being able to dance at your daughter's wedding uh, and, and any number of things. It really makes a huge difference uh, in quality of life for, for the appropriately chosen patient. We're talking with Dr. Jason Schwab with us here on the Megacast. He's uh, a neurological surgeon over at the Henry Ford West Bloomfield. And uh, doctor, if I can ask you, you mentioned that you've been doing this long enough to think about the technology and how much it's changed over the course of your career. It's been pretty substantial. Um, I, somewhat. I mean, to be honest, it hasn't been as huge as one would hope. I mean, I think part of that is because one company had a monopoly on this technology for a number of years. Um, that's no longer the case and hasn't been the case for about five, six years. And so if it's going to be like other things we do uh, where there's competition, I expect to see a lot of leapfrogging of companies uh, one over the other. Um, so we're seeing better ways to uh, program these devices with uh, imaging linked in to make it easier for the neurologist. You can direct current by having leads that are segmented so they face in different directions. Uh, one of the companies now has a device that can be programmed remotely where, whereas you know, if I had a patient coming from the Upper Peninsula, it was really hard to talk to them about coming back and forth for programming or having to travel even to Traverse City for programming. You know, now that's potentially an option to do remotely. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things that are that are out, and there are even more exciting things that are coming. So with that, can I ask as well, uh, how have you and your team been doing throughout the pandemic? Has it slowed down some of the surgeries because people were maybe hesitant, at least at the beginning of COVID, yeah. uh, to get the surgery? Yeah, no, no. I mean, we were completely shut down uh, in terms of doing elective cases, you know, last April or May at the, at the height of the pandemic. Um, and there are still patients who are hesitant to come in and, and be in the hospital, even even though it's really, for most patients, just an overnight stay. Um, and, you know, people have to do what's right for them. Uh, hopefully, I, th I think things seem to be opening up again. Our, our volumes are actually pretty good right now. I'm, I'm quite happy with them. Dr. Schwab with us here on the Megacast from Henry Ford West Bloomfield Hospital. And um, for people that maybe are looking at a loved one and they're starting to notice what they think could be Parkinson's or something is off, what are the first initial signs? So it's interesting, I, you know, to be honest, the, the signs are, are, can be somewhat confusing. So, you know, we see patients, uh, some, some of the earliest signs, frankly, are, are depression. Um, we see patients that come to us uh, after having had shoulder surgery because they have stiffness and it's been perceived as, as degeneration as opposed to, to Parkinsonism. Um, so it, it can be pretty, pretty different. A lot of patients have a uh, decreased sense of smell, which is sometimes a pickup, an early pickup. Uh, patients who have new depression where they don't have any history of depression is sometimes an early pickup. Uh, or a prodrome uh, where you're seeing that before you see other symptoms of Parkinsonism. Um, but again, it can be pretty variable. The, the main uh, criteria we use to determine uh, whether someone has Parkinson's is, is if they have tremor, if they have rigidity, if they have slowness of movement and if they're unsteady on their feet and we don't see another obvious cause. Um, and, they, and the tremor is a very specific type of tremor um, that is at rest. Uh, there's another condition that actually we treat called essential tremor where it's worse with movement and gets better for many people with alcohol. That, that's a different type of tremor, although it's much more common than Parkinson's disease. Um, so, you know, in terms of trying to diagnose your your loved one or your neighbor with Parkinson's disease, it, it, it can be difficult, um, even though, you know, my family tends to make fun of me that I, I tend to diagnose people in the grocery store. <laughs> it's going to be, hard, you know, tough for people with your medical background and your knowledge 
and you know to be in the general public and you see things do you ever just go up to someone and say hey you may want to go to your doctor and get that checked out it depends how severe it is. If, it, if it's mild, I tend not to. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that would be a challenge. Well, Doctor, yeah. it's it's been such an honor and a pleasure to have you uh, with us here today. We so appreciate your time and all the work that you're doing as well. Um, it, it, you're just, I'm looking at your resume and I'm like, I'm not smart enough to even ask you questions. So it's been great having you. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for the opportunity.